entry, The Catch Scarlet Queen, Philip Carney Master. Position, 39 degrees, 40 minutes south, 175 degrees, 4 minutes east. Wind fresh and rising, sky fair. Remarks, cleared Wellington, New Zealand after emergency layover. Reason for emergency, Rocky the third in the dead man's chest. Church, South Island, New Zealand, loaded with crated cotton goods, paper, machinery for the coal mines. It was an easy run, an endless expanse of sun-dappled water smiling from starboard, and the western coast of North Island beckoning with white beaches and waving palms on our port. I was standing my trick at the wheel that afternoon, half my mind on the job, the rest of it wandering back to the other palms on other beaches on other afternoons. They were good memories. But Nielsen's hail brought me back to the present. Captain! He was heading aft toward me from number two hole. Captain Carney, sir. Yeah, Nielsen, what's up? Number two hole, Captain. They was checking the cargo, and I heard something thumping inside one of them crates that was marked cotton. You sure, Nielsen? Yeah, sir. It wasn't just shifting from the roll? No, sir. It was thumping, all right. Oh, here, take the wheel. Mr. Gallagher and I will get down and have a look. flashlight made a little yellow moon with a big ring around it playing on the boxes of number two. Nielsen hadn't said which one was thumping, but that wasn't hard to find out. Here it is. Hand me the crowbar, Red. Yeah. Maybe you better cover me from where you are. Okay, skipper. Yeah. All right, Red. Here it comes. Watch it, skipper. It's coming out. Oh, thank you so much. What? Gallagher, it's a kid. I'd begun to think you were never going to come. Oh, and it was getting quite stuffy in here. Well, well, get out. How'd you get in there oh. in the first place? Oh. Uh, my name is Rockingham Wells III. Some of my friends helped me exchange myself for the cotton goods in the box before you left Auckland. Well, I'll be... What was the uh, idea? Sir, I have launched on the great adventure of my life. I hope it won't inconvenience you too much. <laughs> And so, with Roddy McDowell in the role of Rockingham Wells III, Mutual continues The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen, written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tolman, and starring Elliot Lewis. The Scarlet Queen, proudest ship to plow the seas, bound for uncharted adventure. Every week, a complete entry in the log, and every week, a league further in The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen. Up to the galley and dig up some chow for Rockingham Wells the third. Uh, me? We'll be in my cabin. Run chow for this Go little... on, Red. The yeah, kid's but... Go on, on Red. Uh... Okay, Skipper. And don't think I'm not adding these things up. And, Captain, sir. Yeah. Well, if you could find something other than kid to call me. Uh, my name is yeah, Rockingham Wells. Yeah, I know, and Wells... it sounds like trouble any way you say it. How old are you? Fourteen, sir. And I won't be any trouble, sir. That's all right. We'll figure it out. Rockingham Wells. How would Rocky do for a name? Oh, that's first rate. All right, Rocky, come on, we'll go topside. Uh, yes, sir. And, Captain, it, it's awfully decent of you to... Go on up this ladder. And don't start thinking of me as a big brother yet. You've got a scupper full of questions to answer. Rocky was a gentleman in the original sense of the word, so I couldn't quite bring myself to wring his neck. He peeled off a jacket in my cabin to go in and wash and comb himself. When he came out to turn to on some stew and biscuits Red had brought in, I finally tumbled to an obvious clue to our stowaway's character. He was wearing a T-shirt, and painted on the front of it was a menacing head of a buccaneer with a knife in his teeth. I trust the stew is all right, your lordship? Oh, yes. Quite, thank you. Yeah. Uh, but I, uh, I'm not titled, you know. 
He's not titled. That's enough, Fred. Well, what is this? Treating a stowaway like a king? Never mind. But he's right, Skipper. Skipper, he is? Yes, I I should be lashed to the mast for 20 strokes of the cap and stowed below with iron. Yeah, we'll come to that. Oh, I didn't mean (laughs) that. Give give the prisoner another ration of grog, Red. Grog? The milk, Mr. Gallagher. Pour him another glass of milk. Oh. Mm, Thank you, sir. Yes. Now then, Rockingham. What black brand of skullduggery brought you aboard, huh? Mm, uh, yes. Uh, here, sir. Uh, would you mind reading this letter, please? Uh-huh. Probably penned in the blood of... Oh. Your dad? Yes, sir. My father. Uh, that's too bad, sir. What is it, Skipper? Uh, notes addressed to Martin Wells. He's my uncle. It says, regret to inform you of the death of your brother, Rockingham Wells the Second at sea. Yeah. Uh, Here's the date, cause of death. Comes from port authorities at Wellington. Yes, sir. But it's the list that's important now, sir. What list? It's a list of his personal effects left in the hands of his first mate, of Joseph Ryan Pagali. Clothes, logbook, map, sea locker. Yes, sir, but it's the map. What about the map? Well, Joe Pagali's in Wellington, you see, and he has the map along with the other things. Yeah, it says that here. But my Uncle Martin wouldn't have told me. You see, he'd have taken it all. No, it's rightfully mine, so I just had to steal the letter and run away. You're a little hard to follow. We were talking about a map. Yeah, right? what map? Well, the one Joe Pagali is holding in Wellington. Gentlemen, it is a map that shows the place where my father buried a great and secret treasure. Sure, the adventure of your life, so what else but a buried treasure? Look, Rocky, I got maps too, but not one of them leads to a treasure. Oh, but this one does. I heard them mention it. You see, father and Uncle Martin were in the export-import business together in Auckland. And when you handle strange foreign things, you find maps and other things. Sure. Hey, uh, you want some more chow, Rocky? Uh, no, thank you. You see, uh, Uncle Martin worked in the office, and Father was the captain of the ship. They didn't show me this letter when it came, but I, I heard them talking about it and watched Uncle Martin hide it inside his desk. Does he know you snitched it and stowed away on my ship? Oh, I, I left him a note. I told him I was going after it. So if you could just put me ashore in Wellington... Look, I've could... got a cargo consigned to Christchurch, South Island. I've got to discharge that cargo day after tomorrow morning. I'm not stopping at Wellington. Oh, then how in the world am I ever going to find Joe? And the map? And the treasure? Oh, look, you better get a grip on your imagination, You can't kid. go running around the ocean chasing rainbows. Stowing away on somebody else's ship is... Against the law? Yeah, that's right. But you just got to hunt treasure by going to sea. Oh, nuts. Go take the wheel, Red. We're changing course. Yeah, Stand into the bay for Wellington. Oh, oh, oh We'll lay over just long enough oh, to get you started you back home. You mean you're going to oh, run into her. Wellington? Yes, just yes. Go ahead, Gallagher. Oh. Okay, it's your ship, Skipper. And if we're going to play pirate, I better run up to Jolly Roger. <laughs> Rocky's great adventure had come to an end. But he didn't miss a thing as we walked onto the street that led toward the railroad station. It was getting dark, and he was looking back toward the harbor. I was watching. So neither one of us noticed the strange pair of half-shadows that materialized in front of us. First, I heard a soft, pleasant voice. You will stop, please? I stopped because he was pressing the hard, unpleasant business end of a pistol against my ribs. Yes, now do not make out cry, please. It was oriental, short, very neat, and very pleasant. His countrymen who stood beside him lacked the element of mystery. He was simply the biggest Chinese I'd ever seen. The tongue of my friend is inadequate. He hears, but he speaks only with his strength. Your young companion is rocking on well. What's that to you? Link! Rocky, get away! Rocky, run to the queen! Aye, aye, sir, at once! Link! Hey. Well, I Tell him to let go! You let by get away! Sure, I let him get away! You... Come on, call off your strong arm, man, and tell me what this means. No, I think it's wiser if another one enlightens you. You'll come. Oh, wait a minute. Come, please. No, I'm not going for any. Ling! <laughs> you learn you go where Ling wants you to go. Yeah. That's better. In that automobile, if you please, I shall drive. You will sit in the back seat with Ling. I've had more attractive dates. Now, inside, please. <laughs> You're in being quiet. All questions will soon be answered. We threaded through downtown Wellington for five or six minutes. 
Then we pulled up in one of the darkest streets in front of what looked like an office building. What a nice big one. I'd learned better than to fight Big Lane. So I let him save himself. Well, he shoved me ahead of him into the building. The white man who waited inside lounged in a chair and looked at us out of watery eyes as we came in. He stayed in the chair. Where's the boy? Because of Pigali, he disappeared. We could not bring him in. That was stupid, Chuck. Then for you, Pigali, it will be unfortunate. Put him in the chair. Hey, wait a minute. You're off course if you think I'm Joe Pigali. Be silent. Link. That will be enough, Chuck. Now, Pigali, the map, please, from the locker of Rockingham Wells. The third? The second? Come, this is a waste of my time. And my energy, I don't have your map. The good captain's personal effects were left in your custody, the map among you them. You got the wrong man. Chong? This is the man who was with the boy. Well. Well, there are ways, then, to get cooperation, Chong. Yes. There's a certain teakwood box on the shelf in the next room. Yes. Bring it me, please. We shall see. Yes, honored sir. It is done. When the lid of the box Chong brought back was open, I saw a velvet interior that matched the color of the big jade ring my host wore on his delicate right hand. Cushioned in the velvet was a strange assortment of bamboo sticks, ivory-handled files... And slim bladed knives that look like scalpels. <laughs> Interesting, aren't they, sir? I suppose so, in their way. Their way is very persuasive. What are you getting at? The map. I mean to have that map, sir. I don't know anything about your map. I take ten of these bamboo shoots, these slender ones, carefully chosen. Ten of them. One to be forced under each fingernail, huh? You can't make me tell you something I don't know. Oh, come now. You were first made in my brother's ship. I didn't even know your brother. I didn't know you were the boy's uncle until right now. Why do you make this feeble attempt? Look, you know I was found with your nephew. That's all. We discovered him aboard my ship when we put out from Auckland. Yes, of course. But where is the map? I never saw the map. And I never saw the mate who's supposed to have it. And I don't see why a grown man wants to get so excited about a map that a kid's imagination is magnified into a search for Lane. buried treasure. Will you hold his shoulders, please? Now, get away from me. Truthfully, Ling is invincible. Struggle is fruitless. Now, just be more calm. If you'd make sense, maybe I would. You know about the Ming birds? Admit it. Never heard of them. I have very good reason to believe that you were present at the beginning. My brother sailed Oriental waters for 20 years. By dint of a deep and justifiable gratitude, he received from a warlord in China 11 years ago the missing Ming birds of paradise. Good for him. He did not sell them. I watched the markets carefully. I knew he had them. Therefore, I know he hid them somewhere. The map I want from you will show me where. If I had a map, maybe, but I don't have Fling one. Fling his left hand. What are you... Listen, I'm no hero. If I knew where your precious vases were hidden, I'd tell you. Oh, well, my good man, they're not vases. Oh, whatever they are. They are four matched screens of jade carved by the greatest of all the Ming Dynasty artists. Each is the lifetime work of a man who slept with the priceless jade next to his own flesh to give it warmth and depth of color. And during the light of each day of his life on earth, he worked with infinite loving care, coaxing out the design of birds of paradise. You'll get worked up over these things, don't you? And you will, too. The first bamboo stick. Hold out his left hand, Link. Yeah. You will understand my interest when I tell you that I know each of these screens to be worth the king's ransom singly. And a set of four together. I'm beginning to think I'd like to have them myself. A hand a little higher, Ling. <laughs> oh, maybe you've decided to tell us, Pigali. I am not your brother's first mate, Wells. You know from the letter, his name is Joe Pigali. I'm Phil Carney, and I don't know where Pigali is. You're making I... this difficult. Hold his hand, <laughs> Let go, will you? What you got? Now, Pigali, would you like another? No. I got it enough. I didn't start it to win. I just wanted somebody to hit me hard enough to put me out. I couldn't get my arms free from Ling, but I lifted my legs and smashed both feet of the Martin Wells simpering sadistic face. Uh, he crumbled and went down. Ling! The room exploded in my head and disappeared. Oh, 
How did I get here? I don't remember. Oh, I don't know. You were just staggering down the dock. I... Where did they take you, Skipper? Were they pirates? When I brought Mr. Gallagher back, you were gone. I sure was. Oh, I guess we'd better get going. Where, yes, Skipper? What's it all about? Rocky, you still got that letter in your pocket? Yes, sir. Here. Got a boy. Port Authority, 223 Waterfront Avenue. I guess that's our first stop. Am I to come too, Skipper? Yeah, you're only in this up to your neck. I am? Oh, splendid. Coming, sir. It was morning, and the Port Authority's office had been open about an hour. We walked in and asked the clerk what he had on Joe Pigali. Uh, he's at the King George Hotel, room 222. Is Pigali in trouble? Maybe. Why? Well, yours is the second inquiry for Joe Pigali this Second? Morning. I see. Who was the first? A well-dressed chap, about 50. Not too That's tall, enough. but... That's enough. odds, Rocky. That's your uncle, Martin Wells. Really? I must have done something along the line to convince him I wasn't Pigali. Uncle Martin is after the man. And he's got a fair start. Come on. We got past the clerk at the King George Hotel But the door number 222 was locked Oh, what do we do, Skipper? Anything but waste more time Give me your shoulder Right And 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 I say That's Joe Pagano Stay right where you are, Rocky Come on, Red Yeah Looks like they got here first the marks on his throat remind me of a big Chinese I met. Big Ling. Look for a map, Red, any map. Yeah. Well, this must be the sea locker. Logbook. Logbook? And... Take that along. Hey, look. What? In his hand, a torn piece of paper. Red, it's a piece of a map. Yeah. Not much left, is there? No. No, but there's enough to lead us to the killer of Joe Pagali. Position on this map looks like Cloudy Bay. That's just across Cook Strait, 20 miles from here. You have any idea what this Ming Jade is? Oh, no, sir. The treasure I'm after is an old iron-bound chest. Packed full of doubloons and pieces of eight. Real pirate gold, sir. I know that's what my father promised me we'd look for someday. Uh, your uncle's pretty sure it's Jade, Birds of Paradise. Is that why he killed Joe Pigali? No, I had him killed. But how could Uncle Martin get here to Cloudy Bay? He doesn't have a boat. Oh, uh, one of the charter boats from Wellington. Oh, of course. Like that one over there. What one? Two points off to the starboard bow, Skipper. Well, shiver my timbers, matey, you're right. Hey, Red! Yes, Skipper? Rouse out the crew. I'm coming about. We'll drop anchor to port of that charter boat. And get the small boat over the side. You and I are going ashore. Get the small boat over the starboard! We left Rocky aboard the Queen and headed toward shore. When we spotted another small boat, we beached ours near it. Well, there you are, Skipper. Footprints leading into the brush. That's good enough. Come on. I'll hold it, Red. Yeah. Let's slow down. Try to get in close. Yeah. Trail turns north from here. Let's slow down. We can... Red, look. What? Uh-oh. Looks like we're late. Thirty feet ahead in the tiny clearing stood Martin Wells. Little Mr. Chung on one side, the giant Big Ling on the other. In front of them, in a hole they dug, was an iron-bound wooden chest with the top open toward us. From what we could hear of some very hot words, Wells thought he'd been double-crossed. Then Chong reached forward and slammed down the top of the chest. Wells made a dive for the little man, but Chong had different ideas. Come on, Red. I'm with you. We moved in as Big Ling's hand made an arc side down with the lantern behind Martin Wells' ear. Uncle went down hard, and Chong swung his automatic toward us. We parted to get them from two directions, but Mr. Chong didn't pull the trigger. He pulled the switch. Ah, yes. Good afternoon. Oh, what's this, please, Skip? Keep your eye on the big one. He's tough. Captain Carney, please don't forget the unfortunate past. We have no further wish to fight. We are leaving. You think so? It is discovered that the contents of the buried box no longer merit our concern. 
But Jade isn't in it, huh? No, and so we depart. Your boss is going to hate you when he wakes up. Mr. Wells? Oh, perhaps you do not understand. Uh, the Ming Jade screens were given in gratitude to a friend by one who unhappily had no right to give them. We were sent 11 years ago to bring them back. Some time later, Mr. Wells made inquiries in various markets. This we learned and therefore believed he had some knowledge of the screen. Does he mean they've been spying on Wells all the time? We came to gain his friendship, to watch and wait. But now, there is no jade. Mr. Wells was wrong. We were wrong. We go. Oh, no. Big Ling has the murder of Joe Pagali to answer for. You're an accessory, Mr. Chong. Get the watch, Wells! Martin Wells was conscious, firing from the ground. His first slug caught Big Ling in the shoulder and set off a sudden bedlam. The second shot caught Ling turning as Red and I moved forward. I got hold of Chong's gun hand. Wells was crawling away, but he made his shots count until Gallagher's shoulder sent Ling crawling out of the line of fire. The fourth one was meant for me, but Chong's body jerked and relaxed in my arms. I dropped him and turned to put Martin Wells out of action, but Big Ling had beaten me to it. The giant Chinese was kneeling on Wells' back, a massive hand cupped under Wells' chin. With the last ounce of his strength, he was forcing the head back. Then they both collapsed. You all right, Skipper? Yeah, okay, Red, but those three aren't. They'll never give anybody any more trouble. Come on, Red, take a look at that chest. Roger, Skipper. I see, Skipper. What? Mr. Gallagher. Mr. Kidd. Are you there? Over here, Rocky. Oh, my word. I, I thought I'd lost you. What have you found? Is it a treasure? How'd you get ashore? I swam. What is... Uncle Martin. Yeah, Rocky, Uncle Martin. Look at him, then forget him. You don't deserve him. Maybe I should have put it the other way around. Come on. And, uh, did you find anything, sir? Treasure? We tried to tell you, Rocky. You let your imagination get mixed up with the facts about finding treasure. Things like that are only accidental. Skipper. If you're going to follow the sea, you've got to learn to take things as they come. Hey, Get Captain Skipper. Kidd and Long John Silver out of your head, Rocky. Learn to steer by the stars, but don't try to reach him. Aye, sir. The chest is here, but... Yeah, but, nothing... Skipper, the chest, <laughs> it's filled with these. Fuck. What? Yeah. Doubloons. Oh, I, I thought it was much more difficult than this. Fred, you're crazy. It can't be. Well, look at them. Feel them. Fred, a whole blast of jet yeah. My word, it is full, mm -hmm. isn't it? Look at the stuff. Uh, please, uh... Would one of you mind moving over so yeah, I could well, feel them, too? Oh, oh yeah, Rocky, here. Here, here's one. Isn't it exciting? Oh. But I, I thought treasure hunting would be much more difficult than this. Why, Never mind, Red. Did... Don't say it. Now we, now we can cover them up again and make a map of our own. Cover it up? Cover it up. Nothing. We'll take it and, and cash it. What makes you talk like that, yeah, Rocky? What's the matter with you? Well, I, I thought we could come back for it later. And in the meantime, well, we could sail away in your ship and find some more. Oh, it's great fun, isn't it? Look, Rocky, th this just happened to work out this way. It, it doesn't usually. But I, I, I'm sure there's more of it. Pirates buried loads of treasure. Yeah, but it's just legend, Rocky. It doesn't but mean... But you it... didn't believe me this time, did you? No, Rocky, I didn't. But it wasn't a dream. You didn't believe it, but, but I was sure of it every minute that we'd find the treasure. Maybe that's the difference, Rocky. We've forgotten how to believe as strongly as you do. Maybe if we hadn't, we three could find all the treasure in the world. You know, I do wish there was a way to make you both 14 again. Oh, we'd have a jolly time sailing around in your ship. <laughs> you know, I'd go for that myself. I wish you could work it out, Rocky. I wish you could. <laughs> we stood out of port the next afternoon, we turned over the iron-bound wooden buccaneer's chest full of pieces of eight and doubloons to authorities in Wellington. After the customary report to the Crown, Rocky stood to keep a third of it all for himself, taxes deductible. We put him on the train for Auckland, wired his aunt, and turned Martin Wells and the Oriental pair over to the local morgue. Maybe they should have used more of Rocky's brand of belief and less of their own brand of violence. <laughs> I got ready to cut 
caught the motors, and the men swung rhythmically to their stations when Red bowled them into action. was going to be full of doubloons, huh? Uh, uh, how do you know the chest was even there? I don't know, Red. Near his age, imagination gets mixed up with reality. You can't always tell which is which. I don't know, with faith in your dreams, maybe there's no difference. Yeah? I wonder how come the queen let him aboard in the first place. <laughs> well, maybe he talked to her. This little lady knows what she's doing. <laughs> Here, Skipper. To the queen? To the Scarlet Queen. And happy treasure hunting. After you, mate. After you. Log entry. The catch Scarlet Queen. 5.30 p.m. Wind fresh. Sky fair. Sea cresting with high cross swell. Ship secure for night. Signed, Philip Carney. Master. This is Elliot Lewis. I want to thank Roddy McDowell for being with us tonight. Glad to have you aboard the Queen, Roddy. My pleasure, Elliot. Bill Carney is a favorite radio hero in our household. Well, you're still able to give a mighty convincing performance of a 14-year-old stowaway, even though you're now 19, and an associate producer with Lindsley Parsons Productions for Monogram. What's your latest picture? Well, our latest, Elliot, is the story of a dog. And, by way of coincidence, the title of the film is Rocky. <laughs> well, I hope tonight will prove itself a good omen. You did yourself proud as Rocky the Third. Thanks, Skipper. Good night, Roddy. Mutual invites you to sail into further adventure on the voyage of the Scarlet Queen next week at the same time. Porto Call, Sydney, Australia. of the Scarlet Queen stars Elliot Lewis as Phil Carney with Ed Max as Gallagher and tonight featured Roddy McDowell as Rocky. William Conrad was Martin Wells and Ben Wright played Chong. Music scored and conducted by Richard O'Rourke. The Scarlet Queen produced by James Burton is written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tallman. <laughs> 